was a dark time for the Roman Empire. The glory days of Augustus, of Trajan or of Hadrian were now but a distant memory. Hundreds of years later, the Roman Empire had split into an eastern and a western half, and in 395 AD this split became final. And those two Roman empires were not always on good terms, sometimes even scheming against each other. To make matters worse, in the early 400s, many Germanic tribes had started to invade the Western Roman Empire. Time and time again they were repulsed, but time and time again they tried, until after 406 AD they had managed to cross into Gallia and Hispania, and after years of fighting had managed to establish their own kingdoms on the territory of the Western Roman Empire. In the 420s, the situation had somewhat stabilized due to the competence and vigor of the Magister Militum Constantius III. And in those times, Julius Valerius Majorianus, better known in English as Majorian, was born. We don't know exactly when, but it is believed that it must have been in the mid-420s. From Sidonius Apollinaris, we know that Majorian was the grandson of a previous Majorian who served as Magister Militum under Theodosius. This first Majorian had a son, which would later become the father of Majorian. And Majorian's father served quite likely as a treasurer under the Magister Militum Flavius Aetius. Of his mother we unfortunately know nothing, but we can deduce that Majorian's parents must have been well situated, although they could not have been called very rich by contemporary measures. They possessed a domus and a land estate, where exactly is unknown, but here again we have some indications that Majorian's parents' domus was located in Pannonia, so in the northeastern part of the Western Roman Empire. Of Majorian's childhood we also know nothing, but we can assume that some experiences must have left a deep impression on him. He was a boy in the 430s, a time in which many cities of the empire had been abandoned. Some cities, especially in Pannonia, had already been destroyed by the Sarmatians some 80 years earlier. Maybe the young Majorian saw the desolation of those times with his own eyes, the poverty, the abandoned cities, and wondered what had happened to this Roman Empire in which he was growing up. He certainly had heard the stories about the great conquests of Caesar, of Trajan, and might have been wondering how the Roman Empire could have declined so far, and maybe it was during that time that the seed had been implanted in his mind to strive through his deeds to restore the old glory of Rome. Namely, already as a boy, Majorian entered the Western Roman army in the early 440s, with around 17 years of age. In those days, the Magister Militum Aetius was the strong man of the Western Roman Empire. Already in the early 440s, Majorian is mentioned for the first time, helping Aetius to suppress a Bacaudai rebellion near Amorica in Gallia and defending the city of Tours against these rebels, but on multiple other occasions, Majorian also helped fighting the Bacaudai rebels. These were bands of rebellious peasants and slaves that caused great trouble for the empire. In 447 AD, Majorian distinguished himself, a young man in his early 20s, in a battle against the Franks near the city of Helena in Gaul. He fought against the Franks and their king Clodio, his valor won the day and enabled the Romans a decisive victory against the Germanic invaders. These victories made Majorian famous and his name was henceforth known in all of Gallia. It was during those days in the service of the legendary Flavius Aetius that Majorian made the acquaintance of two other capable soldiers, one called Algidius and the other one called Ricimer. The story of those three would become very intertwined in later years, but while one of those two would prove to be a great friend of Majorian, the other would prove to be his downfall. By 450, Majorian had already grown to such fame that the Western Roman Emperor himself, Valentinian III, took notice of him. 
In 450, the Emperor and his family had moved from Ravenna to Rome, restoring the Eternal City once more to the position of the capital of the Western Roman Empire. In that year, the Emperor invited Majorian to Rome, for the fame of Majorian had made him a worthy candidate to enter the Imperial family. We know that Majorian arrived at Rome that year and met the Emperor in the Imperial Palace on the Palatine Hill. Thus, Valentinian wanted to have his daughter Placidia the Younger married to Majorian. Unfortunately though, Aetius wanted to marry his own son to Placidia in order to strengthen the ties to the Emperor. It is said that Aetius' wife, jealous of Majorian's fame, wanted to convince Aetius to have Majorian executed. But Aetius, conscious of the exploits and valor which the young Majorian had displayed, where they had fought together against the Bacodai rebels and against the Franks, was moved to pity. He didn't have the heart to kill this young hero, and thus he did not give in to the demands of his wife but instead dismissed Majorian from military service in 450. Thus Majorian left Rome that year, left the capital behind and left the service to the empire behind him. He retreated to his domus and studied Roman literature and law. It was during those days that Majorian used his time in order to study the old texts, to study the old greatness of Rome, to study how the degradation of the empire could be stopped how Rome could be restored to old glory. He studied the causes of the decline of the empire and thought about what he would do if he was ever to become emperor of the Romans. What would he do in order to reverse the fall of Rome and to restore the Roman Empire to the old glory that it had enjoyed under Trajan or under Hadrian? During his exile, Majorian learned about the victory against the Huns in 451 in the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, where his old master Aetius had defeated the Huns. In 454, the news had reached Majorian of what had transpired in the Imperial Palace in Rome. With great disbelief, Majorian heard the news of the murder of Aetius, by the hand of the Emperor Valentinian himself. To this it is said, that one advisor said to the emperor, whether just sire or not, I don't know, but I fear that you have cut off your right hand with your left. Aetius's body was exposed in the Forum Romanum for all to see, and the emperor convened the senate, trying to win over this ancient illustrious order of Rome by enumerating the supposed many treasons of the fallen Magister Militum. But the empire was now in a precarious situation. Aetius was the glue that had managed to hold together the fragile pieces of the Western Empire. And with Aetius dead, rebellion started to spring up. For instance, the Magister Milito Marcellinus rebelled in Dalmatia and split away his realm from the Western Empire, not recognizing the authority of Valentinian III. So therefore, after this deed, the Emperor needed friends, needed allies. And immediately, Majorian came to his mind, the young hero that only a few years ago Valentinian had wanted to marry to his daughter Placidia. So by orders of the Emperor, Majorian arrived again at Rome in 454. Though no new effort was made to marry Majorian to Placidia, it appears that Majorian was made comes domesticorum. Valentinian III ordered Majorian to regain control of the Palatina troops that were scattered throughout Italy and that were loyal to Aetius, numbering a few thousand. So while Majorian was away from Rome, trying to muster an army loyal to the Emperor, Valentinian one day chose to attend archery practice on the Campus Martius, the old area of the Eternal City where the Pantheon had been built over 300 years earlier by the Emperor Hadrian. This day was March 15th of the year 455 AD, the Ides of March, half a millennium after the most famous Roman was killed on the very same day, not far from the Campus Martius. Now while the Emperor was riding his horse, it is told, two assassins by the name of Thraustila and Optila suddenly sprang forth without warning and killed the Emperor. It is said that none of the assembled troops rushed to aid the Emperor, for they all remembered the vile murder of Aetius, 
only half a year earlier. Whether that really transpired that way or not, we do not know for sure, but this certainly does show that the Emperor was not beloved by his subjects. And thus died Valentinian III, after an unusually long reign of 30 years, the last of the line of Theodosius. It is thought that it was Petronius Maximus, a rich Roman aristocrat, that was behind this deed. In fact, some sources, such as John of Antioch, recount that Petronius Maximus was even the one who had plotted the murder of Aetius by poisoning the emperor's mind with lies that Aetius planned to kill him. Whether this is true, as so often, we don't know entirely, but the fact that Petronius Maximus had himself be proclaimed emperor on the very next day after Valentinian's murder lends some credence to this theory. Majorian must have been during these events somewhere in Italy, possibly still trying to recruit the Palatina troops. The murder of Valentinian sent shockwaves through the empire. The murder of Aetius was already devastating, but the murder of an emperor was a welcome event for every single barbarian nation that had established itself on the territory of the Western Roman Empire in order to use the chaos and disorganization of the Romans to their advantage and to greatly increase their own dominions. Thus, the Visigoths immediately went on the offensive and conquered much of Hispania. The Franks went on the attack and the Alemanni broke across the Rhine and the Burgundians also increased their domain. But the Vandals, who had established themselves in Africa in the 430s under their cunning King Geiseric, immediately made preparations to attack Italy and to sack Rome itself. Geiseric knew exactly that the imperial armies were in disarray after Aetius' and Valentinian's deaths, split between different military commanders, Maximianus, Ricimer and Majorian in Italy, Marcellinus in Dalmatia and Aegidius in Gallia. A concerted resistance by the Romans, therefore, was almost impossible. And the West could not count on help by the East, since the Eastern Roman Emperor Marcian did not seem to care too much about the West. Thus, on June 2nd, a mere two and a half months after the murder of Valentinian and the proclamation of Maximus as Emperor, the Vandals landed on the banks of the Tiber at Portus and proceeded to Rome. Thus was Rome sacked for the third time in its long history. First Brennus, then after 800 years Alaric, and now Geyseric. The damages of the last sack of 410 by the Visigoths had been repaired and Rome was almost as glorious again as before. The city still had 500,000 inhabitants during those days, but the sack of the Vandals was much more thorough than the sack of the Visigoths. For two weeks did the Vandals loot everything they got into their hands, all riches that they could find, even bronze statues of any sort that adorned all corners of the city. In this chaos, the Emperor Petronius Maximus instead of mounting or organizing any kind of defense, tried to flee the city in disguise. But he was soon spotted, killed and his lifeless body thrown into the Tiber. Thus died Emperor Maximus after a short reign of only two and a half months. Where Majorian was during this time, we don't know. It might be that he simply did not have enough men to mount a resistance to the certainly much larger host of the Vandals. We remember that Valentinian gave Majorian the task to gain control over the around 3000 Palatina imperial troops scattered around Italy. It might be that he had not yet managed to gain control over enough troops, or that he fought together with Ricima against Maximianus or that he tried to convince Ricimer to come to Rome's aid, but the latter's troops were still bruised by the conflict with Maximianus. We simply don't know, but judging by the character of Majorian, there must have been very good reasons, because Majorian was not someone to shy away from aiding his people. After the Vandals left Rome with an incredible amount of booty and the remainder of the imperial family, 
the Visigoths had used their grown influence to proclaim the Gallo-Roman aristocrat Avitus in Toulouse as new emperor in July 455. Avitus then probably marched to Rome and entered the city in September. But he was disliked by the populace from the beginning. He was an outsider, a Gallo-Roman, made emperor by the Visigoths, barbarians. The general mood was extremely bad anyways after the sack of Rome. Repairs had to be carried out and the population was living on the brink every day since the sack. During these days, or possibly even before the death of Maximus, Rikimer and Majorian had made a pact and had joined their forces. We don't know how many troops each commanded, but it is likely that Rikimer had a larger army under his command. Majorian knew Rikimer since way back when they had fought together with Aegidius under Aetius. So this alliance seemed to make sense. But we can assume that already now Rikimer secretly plotted to install Majorian as Western Roman Emperor because he himself could not be Emperor due to his barbarian ancestry since he was a half Suevi, half Visigoth. But through Majorian as a puppet Emperor, Rikimer thought, maybe he could exert great control over the Empire. During that time, Rikimer was made Comes Rei Militaris by Avitus and sent to fight the Vandals. Rikimer sailed to Sicily and defeated a Vandal fleet of 60 ships at Agrigentum and another fleet of unknown size off the island of Corsica. For his success against the Vandals, Rikimer was appointed to the rank of 2nd Magister Militum Praesentalis in Italy, the first having been a certain Remistus. But in Rome, Avitus' position deteriorated quickly. To conserve the food supply, which was still scarce after the Vandal sack, Avitus dismissed his Visigothic troops, but they demanded pay. So he had many remaining bronze statues in the city melted down and minted into coins. The patriots amongst the Romans rebelled and thus Avitus retreated back to Gaul. While he was away, Rikimer and Majorian immediately made use of the situation, fighting against the other Magister Militum Praesentalis, Remistus, whom Rikimer defeated near Ravenna and had him executed. Avitus meanwhile managed to scramble some troops near Arelate, but he could not count on Visigothic support this time, because the Visigoths were busy fighting the Suevi in Hispania. So Avitus entered Italy in October 456 and on the 17th of that month he was defeated near Placentia by Rikimer and Majorian. Now the exact circumstances of Avitus' death are shrouded in mystery and many different versions of his death exist. But the likeliest one is that he was killed by Rikimer's and Majorian's troops either in a skirmish or while trying to hide somewhere in Placentia after having been defeated. Whether Majorian had intended this or not, we don't know. Thus died the Emperor Abitus after a short reign of only 15 months. Rikimer now became Magister Utrius Militai, Magister Militum of the entire Western Empire, while Majorian was made Magister Militum of Italy. Rikimer was also granted the title of Patricius. His scheming was now coming to fruition. Finally, he had the most powerful position of the West, and he thought that in Majorian he had found someone he could control. But he should be proven very, very wrong. After the death of Avitus, the Western throne was vacant, empty. There was no Western Roman Emperor. Marcian, the Eastern Roman Emperor, was during those days the sole Imperator of the Romans. It was now that sometime in March 457, a band of Alemanni had entered Italy, plundering everything in their path. Now Majorian, according to Sidonius Apollinaris, sent his general Burco to defeat this threat. Whether he joined Burco or not, we do not know. But we do know that Burku defeated the Alemanni and Majorian soldiers after this victory hailed him as new Imperator. 
Thus, on April 1st, 457, Majorian was proclaimed emperor at a place called At Columelas, translated as At the Little Columns, possibly an old ruined temple, six miles outside of Ravenna. Thus Majorian, in his early 30s, had completed his journey to become emperor of the Western Romans. But he did not intend to be a puppet of Rikime. No, he had far greater plans for the empire, namely to restore the Western Roman Empire to its former glory. Thanks for watching this first part of the trilogy on the life of Majorian that I have planned for this channel. I want this to be the most detailed series of videos on this far too underrated hero emperor who is far too often overlooked even by modern historians and to whose memory I have dedicated this channel. And please consider supporting my work on Patreon because the long term sustainability of this channel really depends on your support. In the next video of the series we will learn about Majorian's many reforms and how he almost had managed to restore the Western Roman Empire. Thanks again for watching. Gratias tibiago amici and bene valete.